So, uh, uh, Rob, you have the floor. Well, I'm a little bit challenged about how much detail to go into, since some of you have read what I've written and others of you haven't. But I'll give you my best shot at a synopsis. My conversion to the path began in a classroom at the University of Colorado in Boulder when I took a class on Indian philosophy. And when the professor finished speaking about Advaita Vedanta, something in me said, that's what I believe. And in the course of instruction, we also read Autobiography of a Yogi, which made me realize that knowledge must be complemented by practice. I found out about TM in the fall of 1967. Since there was no one teaching transcendental meditation at that time, in Colorado, I flew to Berkeley. Jerry Jarvis was my initiator. And I began having wonderful experiences with transcendental meditation. And I was so satisfied with the experience that I went to the Squaw Valley course in 1968, Squaw Valley, California, which was the first time I met Maharishi. But I was just one of the folks in the crowd. But I became very enthused. And the purpose of that course was really to start a movement and begin getting people to start centers on their campuses, which I did. I started the Boulder campus. We uh, soon began having initiations there. I started a student club, it burgeoned rapidly and uh, everything was going very successfully. We had a great club. And sometime after the club had begun, I was up meditating in the flat irons above Boulder, and I had what I could only describe as awakening of Kundalini, which I had learned about in the classroom. And suddenly it seemed to be happening to me, and it was such a powerful and overwhelming experience that I resolved to apply for teacher training in Rishikesh. I was accepted and began what was a two-year trip around the world, punctuated by nine months in Shankaracharya and Nagar. This was fall of 1969. And during that course, I had another very powerful experience of the awakening of Kundalini. I talked about it in the lecture when we discussed experiences. The next night I had an even more powerful experience. And when I opened my eyes, I was having what I could only describe as God consciousness. Not that I'm there now or was ever there then, but that was my experience. And I recounted that experience during the lecture. And at the end, I jumped up from my seat when Marishi was getting ready to leave. And just spontaneous, and this didn't happen, you know, I just was completely spontaneous, picked up his sandals, knelt at his feet, and he put them on. And when I stood up, he stroked my long hair and called me his golden boy. From then on, I became a favorite, and he paid more attention to me, and... When the course ended and I'd become an initiator, uh, he called me to his bungalow and said that he would like me to stay on for the next course and help with the 
incoming of the new course participants and doing whatever was necessary. I fortunately was a joint honor scholar at the University of Colorado. It was a special scholarship that gave you special privileges about organizing your own curriculum so I could extend my stay in Rishikesh easily and then became uh, very close to Maharishi, was with him every day in his house, got to know all the wonder Jemima Pittman, Carol Hamby, Vernon Katz, all these wonderful folks. And I became, in effect, the skin boy, along with a young boy, Ashok, whom some of you may remember. During the course of now being a skin boy and helping with the course participants, one night, Judith Bork, who I'm glad to see is with us, read a poem and Marishi lavished. I don't know, remember if she wrote it or read it, but anyway, Marishi praised it lavishly. And this led to him inviting her to come and read him a poem occasionally, sort of, you know, relaxation kind of thing. One night, uh, late at night, he told me to go and go to Judas Puri, her, the room where she was staying, and get her to read him some poems. Okay, I went to her room and she was beautifully dressed in a lovely sari, gold jewelry, lipstick. She looked fabulous, beautiful girl. So, but she really looked fabulous. So I took her to Marishi's house and uh, left her to reading poems. And he told me in a show to go and rest. Ashok and I were dearest of friends. He's a wonderful Indian boy. And Marishi would tell us to go and rest, but often we wouldn't. There was a little nook where we had, would wrap in blankets. It's now winter in the Himalayas. It's cold. The Ganges is roaring below. And we would sit there and talk about our privilege at serving the master and being here and everything that goes with falling in love with the master. and feeling you're on the path. Well, to make a long story short, Judas late night nocturnal visits continued. A few times either Ashok and I would go and get her, we would be told to go and rest. But pretty soon it was clear she was making arrangements with Maharishi to come uh, at, at, they'd already made an arrangement for her to come and visit. And we would be sitting up in our little nook and we'd see her coming down the path. This is late at night. You know, this is unprecedented in our experience. After some time of these nocturnal visits, so somehow the inkling began to arise that maybe this is not poetry. <laughs> maybe something else is going on here but I've got a line in what I wrote, uh, which is, it's very difficult to admit what you don't want to know. And it was very difficult to reconcile these late night visits and the obvious deference and favoritism that Maharishi poured on to Judith. But Ashok and I just, went ahead with our duties and tried our best. I mean, we just kind of deliberately put, a, put it out of our mind. Sometime after these visits had been going on, something changed in Ashok. He, he was a very cleanly, punctilious fellow about his appearance. And suddenly he wouldn't shave, his shirt would be a little scraggly. Like he just had stopped being fully committed somehow. But we're just carrying on. 
at some point in time then, Ashok and I started having a different conversation instead of our joy of being with the master. He started talking about how could I help him get to the United States and start a life there and so on. And it was clear that something had changed in his mentality. Now, I lived in the Puri away from the house, but Ashok lived in Maharishi's house. And my surmise is now that he actually somehow knew what was going on. But we never discussed the subject. Finally, the time came to leave the ashram. I left the ashram, traveled throughout Southeast Asia for several months, and got back to Boulder, where I had one more semester to finish my bachelor's degree, which I was doing by writing an honors thesis. And at the end of uh, my graduation, I went to visit with Maharishi for a final time. I should, I should mention that he had asked me to organize a lecture at Mackey Auditorium, the biggest auditorium in Boulder, on the campus of Boulder. And it was a huge success, three or 4,000 people, giant press, everything, it went great. And by this time I was a golden boy, uh, one of four people in America that were authorized by the movement to go anywhere and give lectures. And it was obvious to him that I was totally committed and had a pretty good clue about what I was doing. And so after this lecture, I went to where Maharishi and the then course were staying, which was in Estes Park, Colorado. And it was right at the end of that course. And during my meeting with him, Maharishi asked me, what are your plans? And I told him that I was gonna be a golden boy. I was gonna travel around the country and lecture. And where needed, I would be able to initiate people. And he invited me. He said, you, you would be much more valuable if you joined the international staff and came to Europe with me. Well, that was, <laughs> you can imagine just fine with me. Next thing I knew, I'm on an airplane to Mallorca, where the first European course was to begin. During my time waiting for the flight to Mallorca, I befriended Casey Coleman, whom I'm sure many of you knew. And on the flight to Europe, we were asking about how we got there. And he said, you know, he wanted to serve the master. And in fact, he had talked with Maharishi about becoming a brahmachari, and that was his plan. Well, I realized that if you're gonna be in, you may as well be all the way in. And my talk with Casey made me realize that if I were really serious, I should do that as well. And when we got to Mallorca, I told Maharishi that this was also my desire, and he said, fine will initiate you. Well, as it turned out, even though Brahmacharyhood was Casey's idea, I was the first one to get initiated. He was the second, and I once again became the skin boy. And as Brian's told you, he, I would be seen rushing around and carrying out Maharishi's wishes and doing what the skin boy does. Casey and I were with him all the time. We kind of tag team things. And uh, there we were, Every, everything was going as perfectly as you could imagine. After the first Mallorca course, we went to the, to the United States, the SCI symposium happened at, uh, at University of Massachusetts Amherst. And I remember in my orca, Marishi planned for the symposium and he's, we should have an army general, we should have a Nobel Prize winner, 
And who is this man, Buckminster Fuller? We should, we should have him too. And I remember thinking pretty cynically, good luck with all of that. Then I remember the opening session at Amherst where sitting on the stage was a four-star army general. Next to him was Melvin Calvin, Nobel Prize winner. And uh, on Marishi's right hand was Buckminster Fuller. Well, I thought, well, this, this is pretty great. So next thing, we went back to Majorca after our time in the United States and the next Majorca course began. To make a long story short, on that course, a young lady whom Judith Bork, I'm glad to see Judith is with us, has chosen for her nom de guerre, perhaps that's speaking hyperbolically. But anyway, she shall be henceforward known as Belinda. And uh, the second person whose name we're going to be hearing in Judith's book is known as June. Belinda still wishes to remain anonymous, but I will reveal that June is April Clemens, since if you knew April, you knew what a, what a wonderful person she was. Anyway, my ORCA course begins. Marishi starts paying a lot of attention to Belinda. I'm now Brahmachari, pledged to celibacy. Belinda was quite pretty, and I confess, uh, I took a shine to Belinda myself. At one point in time, Maharishi, uh, she was with him. She'd begun inviting him to come to her room for various meetings, even though she was on the course. And during that meeting, he said, I need help with my mail. I want you to take a little time off to help me with my, my personal mail. So she came a few times in the afternoon and they did some mail and I would be in and out of the room and perfectly normal thing. He, he would give people special projects. After she'd been doing this mail thing for a time, he asked me to call a woman in uh, in New Delhi, uh, who, who was known to me, and asked her to buy 30 saris, enough for every day of the month, he said, and some gold jewelry, and so on and so forth. Pretty soon, a big box of saris arrived. He opened the box, went through them. He was very happy with what was there. And if you've read my paper, you know the story of the saris is important because there's a pre-story about Judith and the saris that's very important as well. When Maharishi, as he was cultivating Judith, bought her saris and jewelry and had her wear makeup and so on. Well, after Judith, or I mean, after uh, Belinda had been doing mail in the afternoon, one night at the close of business, Marishmi, Marishi asked me to go to Belinda's room and have her come and do the mail. So I went to her room, knocked on the door. She opened the door. Oy vey. I'd never seen her in a sari. And suddenly here she is. And, and the, these were, you know, the max ultra most expensive saris gold jewelry, makeup. And Belinda was a pretty no-nonsense kind of gal. For your information, she became a very important lawyer specializing in corporate fraud and won millions of dollars in judgments for her clients. No-nonsense kind of girl. And she looked very uncomfortable, you know, like she was dressed up in a costume. Well, okay. But as I looked at her, my mind flashed back to Rishikesh and the night, the night I went and first 
got Judith and brought her to Maharishi's bungalow. And some, something in my brain tripped, is this a fetish of this guy? Uh, the Western girl in the sari and something triggered in my brain about what my suspicions of, though I had repressed them in, in uh, Rishikesh, suddenly those suspicions came to the fore once again. And they were reinforced by subsequent events. One, uh, Maharishi, when he would have Belinda come, he would always tell me to go and rest. One night he failed to do so. So, you know, the skin boy, you're on until the last person leaves. And when she went in, she was all coiffed up. And when she left, she didn't look like she'd been doing the mail. You know what I'm saying? So this planted, uh, th this, this really began my wake up call. So subsequent visits to Belinda late at night occurred. One night, Casey was on the door and the next day he told me that he'd gone to get her and she was wearing nothing but a bathrobe and he could tell there was nothing underneath it. And I'm like, well, this is another tell. Now we come to the denouement or the, the final reckoning in Majorca. Uh, April Clements and I, we were often sent on missions together. We were like brother and sister. And we had bought this peasant blouse for when we were on some mission in Monacor, the main town in Majorca. And she came to me and told me that she had been working with Maharishi on some project and had leaned over and out of the blue, the guy had just stuck his hand down her blouse and took a long and lingering feel. And then like it's her fault, he told her, don't wear low cut blouses. Well, this disturbed her considerably because was it her fault and he was giving her a lesson not to be, or was he hitting on her or what was going on? So now here's another tell, both in the saris. Judith's coming to read poems. Belinda's coming to do the mail. Uh, June, my sister, has now been groped by Maharishi. Somehow, April, uh, who always seemed to know everything going on, she somehow found out that Judith and Maharishi were lovers. And after this groping incident, April went to Judith and confronted her with the fact that she had every reason to believe that Maharishi and Judith were lovers. And Judith writes beautifully about this moment in her book, Robes of Silk, Feet of Clay. And uh, she can better tell the story than I, but anyway, that meeting triggered endgame for Judith, myself, Belinda, and April. Because after April talked to Judith, she went to Belinda because now I had told her about the saris and so on, and she suspected what was going on with Belinda. She confronted Belinda, is this what's going on? And the result of that meeting was Belinda went to chalk to Judith. They compared notes. The next morning, April fled early in the morning before dawn with Belinda, took her to the airport and Belinda flew to Salisbury, Switzerland, 
which as you know, was in the international headquarters for the movement where I am privileged to have spent many wonderful days and nights. The next morning, uh, when Maharishi learned that Belinda was gone, he put out an all points bill bulletin what had happened to her. And it was quickly enough revealed that April and Belinda had been seen driving north uh, towards Palma de Mallorca, the airport. And April was called on the carpet. Uh, it was revealed that Belinda had gone to Salisbury. And once Maurishi found that out, uh, he had me call Bev and Fran, the wonderful Australian girls running the International Center and to let them know when Belinda arrived. She did arrive, uh, Maharishi put a call into her and uh, when the call came through, uh, he told me to close, leave the room and close the door. And so I sat outside the door for an hour and a half listening to Maharishi play the role of a lovesick teenager. That's all I can describe him as, pleading with Belinda to come back, anything. You know, I, I, the door was sufficiently closed. I couldn't make out all the words. And you're in a tough situation. You know, you know, he wouldn't want you to be listening to this, but that's your job to be there. Anyway, it was, it, 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 it was just like a final thing for me. He did not sound like a man with whom there was no distinction between himself and Brahman, he, he sounded like a lovesick teenager that wanted his girlfriend to come back. That night, April and I took a long walk on the beach, and then I found out about her going to Judith, Belinda going to Judith, Maharishi, Judith, or I mean, April then going to Maharishi and telling him that both of his paramours knew what he was up to, that they weren't the chosen one, that in fact, there were two of them right there, that he was making whoopee with. <laughs> so anyway, that was the basic end of all of our three commitments to Maharishi as a master. It didn't happen the next day, but each one of us would eventually leave Maharishi and set out on our own because we simply couldn't accept the fact. Now, you must understand to the women, it's bad enough. They've had some idea that they're special, you know, that there's no one else, that they're specially called to help him carry this enormous burden of enlightening the world. Or what they, they all have to tell themselves something why this is okay in their case. But in my case, there was nothing that made it okay because here I was. Uh, a brahmachari and folks, I'm a Scorpio. I love the girls. I was deeply in love with Vigie Litchfield at the time. She reciprocated it and uh, you know, um, and as Ned put it, you guys are being celibate and he's hitting on the girls. So it was especially devastating for me as a brahmachari to have to face the fact that not only was, a sex, was he a sexual predator, he was a hypocrite. So that's as much as I can tell you about my direct experience while I was right there on the scene. After that, I got, Judith got in touch with me and we compared notes. Ned Wynn, whom I'm sure you remember, uh, soon after 
I had left Maori. She was in graduate school at UC Santa Barbara. Uh, I'd fallen in love with the Santa Barbara girl. Ned was my best man. And we had a uh, searching talk about what he knew and had seen. And most importantly, he met with Belinda and Judith not long after their respective assignations had come to an end. And they told him explicitly what had happened. And so the combination of what Ned had to say, the other important thing, Ned was very good friends with Mia Farrow. Uh, Ned's grandpa was Edwin, the famous uh, silent movie comedian. His father was Keenan Wynn. Catch him in Dr. Strangelove as the US major. He plays a great role. Ned grew up in Beverly Hills. He was best friends with me at Bear. I won't say best friends. He knew her. They would see each other at birthday parties. Um, he talked with Mia Farrow immediately after she came back from India. And Mia recounted to him her attempted seduction uh, scene in Maharishi's cave, which of course led to her fleeing the ashram along with another American girl who Maharishi had also put, put the makeup on. So now here I knew three women, Judith, Belinda, and April, that Maharishi had sexually abused. There was confirmation from Mia Farrow and uh, there were stories about another American girl as well. So from that time forward, I uh, decided I would, would have nothing more to do with the movement. Uh, even though I still believed in meditation, I still believe in meditation. Uh, and so I left the movement and that was that. So that's my story, folks. That's all I can tell you from direct and personal experience. If you want to know more on the subject, you cannot do better than read Judith's book, Robes of Silk, Feet of Clay. The other book I would urge you to read is Secret of the Mantras by Richard Blakely. He was on the course in Rishikesh. He knew the Beatles personally and his girlfriend, the story of what Maharishi did to her uh, is appalling. Also, uh, Ned Wynn's book, we Will Always Live in Beverly Hills is a wonderful read. And therein he recounts in greater detail than what I've given you, what he was told by Belinda, by Judith, and by Mia Farrow. And uh, the final book is Inner Light, The Influence of India on the Beatles by Susan Shumsky, where she goes into detail about what went down in India. I'm open to well, questions or? Yes, yes. Uh, uh, please, anybody who'd uh, like to ask Rob a question, uh, please raise your hand, your digital hand, uh, at the bottom of your screen, it, uh, you'll see there, uh, there's a button called reactions. And, and uh, there you can see raise hand. Uh, and we'll take people in in order. Um, except that uh, perhaps we'll, we'll uh, take Judith first, since she's so much a part of the story. If you'd like to unmute uh, uh, your microphone, Judith. Um, or I can do it for you. There you go. Uh, so Judith. Yeah, I just um, I have a picture of April, which I I feel I'm I'm okay about doing this because she is deceased, as perhaps 
everyone knows. I don't know. But I have a picture of my book here on, I don't know, page. It's dark, so I can't even see what page it is. But anyway, um, let me see if you can see it. Uh, how is this working out? There she is right there. Can you see that? Oh, uh, yeah. So we're in the same. It's a kind of a unique picture because we're in the same photo at the same time. My hair, I'm looking down. I'm in a white shawl and we're just walking along this is this i, I think is in lavinio um where a group of us are you know we're out looking at something and and sort of the inner circle is you know with him as usual so there you have okay thank you yes isn't she lovely beautiful, beautiful. Mm. So let's um, let's continue. I think uh, Sevilla was next. Uh, I'm I'm just uh, wanting to mention uh, the uh, Phil's remark in the chat, which is uh, Phil. Would you like to say it yourself? What you put in the chat? Um, okay, um, Rob. Um, in my memory, uh, April and and Joe Clark died in the summer of 1973 while still working for uh, the movement. So uh, and I thought you said that um, she had left. So I wanted to reconcile that and also ask what you know about what Joe would have known. Um. Well, first of all, she did leave right after Belinda left and went back hmm. to the States. And she was very vocal about what was going on. And although I didn't talk to Joe directly, I heard that she had told Joe about what was going on. Yeah, and I heard that too. He a, that he was also talking about it. Now, as I say, each of us would leave in our own time and in our own way. I, I didn't, as soon as Belinda left, you know, rush to the airport and fly back to the United States. Right. There were complications about my leaving. When I graduated from college, I became a conscientious objector. And I got approved as my service working for the TM movement. By the way, Phil, 100% good to see you. You too. Uh, <laughs> it's, it's, hi, Phil. Yeah, this is all pretty touching. I'm sorry, you know. Anyway, uh, so I couldn't exactly leave because I had had approved as my service working for the TM movement. That was my, instead of folding laundry in the basement of an insane asylum. I was training teachers to fight drug abuse. Uh, so this was to happen for two years and it happened to be exactly during the time I was with Maharishi. But so I did stay on. April and I were sent to Portugal even after we knew what was going on because soon after we knew what was going on and Belinda left, those of you who were there may remember blasting began. And next thing we knew, we had to go find another place to hold the course. April and I were sent to uh, Portugal. And after a few days of looking, we got the call. John Black had found a, a place in Fujifonte. And when we got to Fujifonte, uh, Maharishi then retired, Casey, myself, Ned Wynn, and Tom Piskulik from duty. And my surmise is now, he knew that Ned and Casey and I were, he knew I was dear friends with April, and he knew that she knew, and that Belinda knew, and that April knew, and he had every reason to think that we might know. 
So he basically iced us and then the Texas Skin Boy crew came in and we were sent to round in uh, Fujifonti. So I never had to actually convent, confront Maharishi or even really face the fact that I was now with a hypocritical master who was a, a vile sexual predator. Let me emphasize one thing here while we're on the su subject of sexual predation. It's one thing if your boss is Donald Trump and assaults you, because you can figure, well, that's what I hear what bosses do. Or if you're anyone who's a normal kind of person, if a woman is sexually assaulted by them, she has an immediate right to think this is not okay and do something about it. But if your master puts the make on you, you're at sea. You don't know what to make of this fact. And you can do one of two things. Judith made of the fact that she was special, that, that she was chosen. Others to whom this has happened did the same thing, that they were special, they're the only one. So you have no real point of judgment because you're operating from the belief that he's an enlightened master. By definition, he can do no wrong. So if he's coming on to me because he can do no wrong, it somehow must be okay. So it's the worst form of sexual predation because a woman is left completely at sea with the normal reference points, which would enable her to analyze the behavior of a predator. Now, it so happened, uh, one day we got a call. I don't remember where we were. We may still have been in Fujifonti. Jerry Jarvis got a call from someone at Sims headquarters in Westwood that the FBI had been there and wanted to know where this Rob Gordon McCutcheon guy was uh, because they were checking up to see that I was doing my conscientious objector service. And the girl in the office said, oh, Rob, he's in Europe. And they said, no, nah, we didn't approve going to Europe. He must come back to this office. So Jerry told me that, and I got a plane ticket back to LA and spent six months working in the office uh, of Sims office to finish out my conscientious objector stint. By then I'd already decided to go to Santa Barbara as a graduate student. I'd fallen in, Patty, in love with Patty Look and Santa Barbara, which is a great story about Mike Love and his MGTD and driving it to Patty's house. I won't bore you with it. But anyway, I was just extracted. I never had to confront Maharishi. Fate just made it easy for me to leave. And I continued to practice TM until uh, the great spirit tapped me on the shoulder and a different path opened for me. So I never had a breaking. I just knew that was over and I knew Maharishi was a hypocrite. And I'd also had firsthand experience with his extreme cruelty to people. I also was very upset about the way he was extracting money from people by buttering them up, big sums of money. So, I left the movement and pretty much didn't think about it again until I got a call from Judith Burke about 15 years ago. And it all came up again in, in the context of her wonderful book. Uh, a lot of interesting material there, uh, Rob. Uh, Miguel. Uh, can you hear me? Yes. Yep. Okay. Uh, yeah, I have a question. I don't want to sound insensitive. Uh, I really don't, but I do have to make this question. Uh, I gave 15 years of my life full time 
to the movement. And the most productive years of my life involved in national, international projects, some directly uh, under the orders of Marishi, his direction. Uh, a lot of things was completely crazy for me, in my opinion, so much that I actually said to Marishi a few times, and when he asked me to do certain projects, that no, I won't do them, because you know, because you're crazy. <laughs> That's not the reason I gave, but I, I refuse. So anyway, my question is this. If I had known that Marishi was corrupt financially, involved in uh, financial corruption, as I find out later, I have direct experience of that, that he was involved in corruption, financial corruption. If I knew that he was involved in this type of behavior, sexual behavior, because uh, the problem here is not sex, is the fact that he lied. That's the main problem for me. I will not have given one minute to the movement. So my question is, by not telling this story, are you, Judith, the other woman, whoever the skin boys, whoever knew, and please, I don't want to be insensitive. In no way I'm making any judgment or criticism. I know it's difficult. I know that. But if I had known this, my life will be completely different. And probably I will not be living now as I am on the level of poverty according to Canadian standards. It probably will be different for, for my dear friend Brian, who gave 50, 50 years of his life, 50 years to Marishi in the movement. And to many, many thousands, others, hundreds and probably thousands of people. So my question is, why did it take so long for you people to come out and tell this story? And by the way, bless you for telling it now. That's all. Uh, an important reason, Miguel, is that you know you won't be believed. Because every cult, every person like Maharishi, in order to wield power over people, has to instill in their mind that any negativity about him or the movement is directed by demonic forces. I hope you all get a chance to read an article I wrote when I was at Princeton. It was my first published piece as a, I was a graduate student then. Uh, it, it, it's a, it's a, it applies the model of a British anthropologist to the movement and shows how its beliefs change through time. From, from one where there's not much in the way of ethics or metaphysics or requirements, just meditate to suddenly it morphed into a very powerful cult. And about this crucial time, 1972 to 1976, is when the movement lost its path. And Maharishi began really what I can only describe as a serious effort at mind control or for everyone. And about that time, we started hearing about demons. And I remember when his plane crashed, well, it was John Black's fault, who, who, who you had a tough, you spent 15 years, Miguel. John Black spent, what, 30 years working his guts out for the movement while he's on Maharishi's shit list. Got no strokes from the master, a terrible tale, because he held a, a puja for Maharishi. And the whole thing was demonology then. Well, so I can't really say that I was afraid, but I knew that even if we came forward with this story, look what happened with Mia Farrow. I mean, if nobody's gonna listen to Mia Farrow, and John Lennon and George Harrison, when they told their story, uh, if you read my paper, you know, that's why John left. He rips Maharishi's poster from the wall. 
walks all over it. He gave interviews that Maharishi was hitting on the women. Mia Farrow went on record as that Maharishi, you know, try, people tried to talk her out of it. And she said, I know a past from a puja. So part of the reason is you're feeling you won't believe, if they're not going to believe Mia Farrow and John Lennon, they're going to listen to me. So that's one reason. The other reason is once the master starts talking demonology, now I'm sure Judith can tell you much more harrowing stories, but you wonder what some crazy TM guy who thinks that you're besmirching the master's reputation might do to you because you're possessed by a demon. Now, I never consciously had that thought that anyone might do something to me. But first, it's the idea of not being believed. Second, there's the real threat something might happen. And finally, there's just you want to get along, with, get on with your life. I thought about writing a book on the subject. I went to New York and talked with an agent. I came up with the name of my book, Robes of Silk, Feet of Clay. And the first time Judith reached out to me, she had decided to tell her story. And she gives a moving account of why she didn't tell her story until she finally did. Um, so all of those things were factors I'm in graduate school at Princeton. I mean, you, you ain't just laying around there. You know, you're, you're working seven days a week as hard as you can. So there's, there's just, you got no time to do it. But mostly you just don't want to be disbelieved. Judith will tell you all you want to know about that. And I think my, I my think friend, if, excuse me, one more thing, Brian. If I could have met you somewhere in an espresso shop, wherever you worked, and we had a talk about TM, and I knew you were pouring your life down there, I would have taken you by the shoulders and done everything I could, you and me, mano a mano, to convince you, don't do this. The guy is a hypocritical sexual predator. And he's a greedy bastard, as you found out, and financially corrupt. Yes, yes. I, can I say something, Brian? Sorry, just to yeah, yeah, add, yeah. Just add a little thing. The real, it's really. It's, I'm sorry. It's just it's it's kind of personal to me. So it gets. I'm really pissed off because of this. It's one of the things that. But I'm pissed off with myself more than anything. Not with anyone. It's just that I spent when I found the level of this. How these functional things were in Vlodrop. I was in Vlodrop. And uh, the level of corruption that was involved well, financial. Of course, what I did was try to find an excuse uh, towards Marishi, right? You know, it's not his fault. People around him because they're all a bunch of idiots, and they are a bunch of idiots. Uh, and so you say, what, what, did I, what did I say to myself? Okay, we, ne we need to change things from the inside. You know, we need to to bring prayer strike and glass nut uh, to the TM movement. And so I spent the next years working very hard, pushing, you know, uh, contacting my colleagues, trying everything I could to making proposals in order to change things from the inside. Uh, and I went, I fight with everyone. I fought with national leaders, with international couples, with the uh, ministers of the age of enlightenment with Rajas, I mean, really fought with them. I had huge fights with them, open fights in front of everyone. And to the point that, you know, they, they, they just told me to shut up or just turn their backs on me and, and go out because I was, you know, just screaming at them or whatever. I had huge fights. I, I was always open about what I did not agree. And I had huge fights. The last time Marishi asked me to do something, a project, international project, I told him I'm not going to do that because it's illegal, according to Portuguese and European law. It's legal, illegal, Marishi. This could take me to, to jail or anyone else who involves in this project. And, and the guy who did this was Benny Feldman because he passed the phone to Benny. And I told Marishi, I'm not doing this because it's illegal. 
But if I still was rationalizing it, Marcy doesn't know. He doesn't know these things. It's these people, these only these people, the nomenclature around him who are doing. If I had knew that everything pointed directly to Marcy, as I find out later. Even I mean, I'm not even talking about the, the sexual activity. I'm talking about just he's, he's taking money from donations and, and putting in India. If I had known this, if people had told me, my life would be, have been different. I would just have left. And so I now feel like an idiot. I spent so many years fighting from the inside, trying to be meaningful reforms, when the fact, the culprit of all these crimes started with the founder. Well, you've answered your own question, Miguel. Look what happened to you when you tried to tell the truth. I mean, there's nothing Maharishi couldn't understand about. Maharishi, we can't do this. It's illegal. Talk to Leon Weiner. They were smuggling suit fo- suitcases full I know, of cash I know. I know. on airplanes from LA to Majorca. And then he would pick a courier to carry that suitcase full of cash to Switzerland so it wouldn't go through normal channels. And my friend Leon ended up in a jail in Palma de Mallorca. And we got out of it only because one of us was dispatched to meet with Generalissimo Franco and hand him a briefcase with 50,000 in cash. And the next thing we knew, the money was on the way to Switzerland. But you tried. Brian has told me his painful stories of trying. I'm sure all of you have tried to break through this barrier of Maharishi can do no wrong or excusing him. He doesn't know about it when he was the source of it all. So you've answered your own question. Why would they listen to me or listen to you if they're not gonna listen to Mio and John Lennon, you know? Thanks, thanks Rob. Uh, um, Another thing is uh, uh, that you were young and what I wonder is what about the, the older people there who knew, uh, I don't want to name names, but y- y- you know who I'm talking about. Uh, um, and uh, it, it's just, uh, uh, they, they knew, they must have known, I guess they rationalized it as in some way or other. Uh, but um, it's, it's very strange. Um, Judith. Yeah, I mean, when I knew, I knew that, I mean, when I heard that April died in that crash, and then I found out that just before that, she was, you know, she was talking, she was telling people. I mean, I saw a direct connection. I still don't know. You know, I still don't know what happened there. But he lost Joe Clark at the same time. Um, and Ron Michael Love. Yeah. He was the sweetest, most innocent <laughs> brahmachari, dead to totally innocent. Joe Clark. And- How many, was it four or five people in the plane, Rob? Um, there was the pilot in yeah. Joe and Ron in April. Mm. What was Ron's last name, Rob? Michael Love. Michael Love. Okay. M I C H A E L L O V E. My uh, the question that we're all wondering is a- about all of this uh, these funds that were funneled to India for all those years. Uh, uh, and we know that it just went on for for the, for the next fifty years. It, MIU was 
uh, the the funds from MIU were constantly being drained uh, to send money to India. So uh, MIU remained a kind of uh, a smallish college, and the 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 roads were potholed, and the buildings were not properly built, and all of this not properly maintained because money was continually going from India um, to there, and you know money from all over the world was going to India. And the the question is, why India? Because Maharishi didn't personally benefit from that money uh, uh, because he, he lived a relatively simple life. I mean, he worked really hard his whole life. I mean, I was there. I saw him working till four in the morning, uh, um, day after day. And... He, you know, he was constantly building up the movement, um, and you know, we we've all had great experiences with TM. You know, probably none of us. Uh, um, I mean, some of us are doing other practices of transcending, uh, and, and, but TM, I think we all agree, works and does wonderful things. Um, and and Marsha was working to to spread TM. All those years. My point is, he he wasn't personally benefiting by that money that was going to India. It, uh, um, it, you know, his family certainly were, but there was m m way more than his family needed. Okay, they the they needed the odd hundred million, but uh, there was much more than that. So, w w what was that money being used for? Is uh, you know, was it being used for politics? Was it supporting a political party? Um, and uh, I don't know if anybody has any uh, um, any insight, genuine insight into that. Uh, but that's one of the uh, the, the the questions. Uh, so you're part of a cult. You have this idea that you're saving the world. So kind of everything that you do, you know, is okay because you're so, you have such a, a positive motivation. You have devotion. But, well, and, and, and so it's like excused. It's like, oh, well, we can bend the rules because we're all doing such good and people tell themselves that. And, I used to think that he was, he was doing, I would always conclude my thoughts with, well, he's doing more good than bad. Mm. And I was uh, not devoted. I was not devoted. I didn't saw him as my master, the man, the God man. He was just a, a wonderful teacher who gave me a wonderful technique and I wanted to help the world. Not devoted. Okay, oh, sorry a, to interruption. That, that's a form of devotion. Uh, Miguel, to the world. As far as, again, quickly referencing his lifestyle, Brian, you told me about a Jaguar he bought for one of the young ladies on his staff. We won't name her. Um, yeah. I want to say that he bled us all. We gave more than we should have in most cases. And again, Mother Mira's story of not taking money from a mother with four children. You keep that money, you're raising children. So he, he never distinguished that way. What is courage to me? It means openness. And as you said, it's difficult, Rob, it's difficult to admit what you don't want to know. Denial takes many forms, has many, many degrees. As far as don't judge, don't discern, there's a distinction. To judge is one thing, we need to develop discernment. It's the most powerful trait. And to do that, we have to think. And to think, we have to have facts. We need to dig into the dirt as deeply as possible. We can't have fear, we have to be open, we have to be objective. We can't bring our hopes and desires for the image of what we are, want our guru to be into what we are learning. This is the time. We're all elderly. It's not the time to cut corners and make rationalizations. Another thing is that these people all have PTSD their whole lives. All these people that went through this with Marishi, we can't know how they feel. They've survived. We thank them for being here and sharing their story. That's what I call courage. Because if you've ever been around a sexual predator, you know that you can't imagine what that will do to your psychology lifelong. Another thing I wanna say, 
sorry for raising my voice, is that, uh, uh, yes, he brought it all to us, but we have to wonder, could it have been done more cleanly? Maybe it's Kali Yuga. Maybe it's what we deserve. But do we want to do that? What about next incarnation? Shankara says in here, greatest flaws, greed and lust. What is a liar? Someone who lies all the time. So let's look for a guru. Guru Dev was looking for a guru without anger. Great. I'll look for one without greed, lust, and deceit. Okay. Last thing I want to say is that we need to know, and I've already said this, when we come to ethics, yes, we must deal with ethics all, all the time, 24-7. There's that barley. No matter what level you get to, if you can't become your own Rishi, you're not doing what Marshi wanted you to do because that what he, that's what he did task us with. And if not now, when? We need to accept however dark the mud is, however deep, the shadows, we have to go there because as Charlie said, if you don't deal with the monsters under the bed, they will deal with you. They'll manipulate in the subconscious. The time for all these illusions is over. We were born here to end suffering in our own lives, to not perpetuate it. Marshy hurt people. He did. And we have to be strong enough to accept that and still appreciate what he did give. I'll do TM for my whole life, but there was a better way to do it. I'm sorry. I don't want to go through this again in my next life. That's me. Thanks. Thanks, Delana. Um, I guess two minutes is too short. Let's make it three. Uh, um, uh, Judith, you have a comment. Yeah. Um, this this conflict that's going on right here is, is a conflict that's been within me my whole life in thinking about what happened to me. Uh, and I think we're all sharing this situation of not being able to put together that Maharishi had so much light and so much power of consciousness and so much of what we needed. And at the same time, he was dysfunctional on an ethical level. I mean, the question is, okay, enlightenment. I don't know whether or not he was enlightened, but uh, many of us want to be enlightened. There's this whole thing of what does it mean to be enlightened? And I think that the spiritual communities, there's a confusion there. The spiritual communities think that if you become enlightened, you will be automatically, you will be an ethical person. It doesn't seem to work that way. That's right. I, I, another thing that I would like to say, I'm afraid I'm speaking out of turn here, is that the question that r arises is whether Maharishi was enlightened. He certainly had a lot of power. He certainly had a lot of intuition. Uh, and, you know, it appeared that he had what we might call cities uh, he he certainly had tremendous charisma. He certainly had a very powerful intellect, uh, but th that doesn't necessarily mean that he was enlightened, and it doesn't necessarily mean that he can lead the rest of us to enlightenment. I mean, se setting aside the, the the question of what we would describe as uh, uh, from a normal point of view. Uh, uh, horrific behavior, horrific behavior towards women. I mean, it, it, it's, um, it, it, you know, in, in some cases it was like a love affair, but in other cases it was it's simply abuse. And, uh, it, you know, it's, uh, uh, if, if that, I mean, we can think that that's, uh, uh, some people can think that that's part of enlightenment but we we really don't know what whether he was enlightened or not um so the, the, that question arises we can't just assume that he was enlightened he might have been just and in my perspective it's most likely that he was um just a very very powerful person uh in intellect wise and so on 
when we look at the movement today, uh, uh, the, the the official Maharishi movement, the TMO as we call it, we see a very very dismal picture. We we see that the the the, the teaching of TM is fading away uh, in every country. We see that these rajas are uh, an absolute absurdity. Uh, uh, that they, they are uh, uh, they are incompetent. Uh, they, some of them are probably corrupt. Uh, uh, we see again the same picture of, uh, um, you know, to, to use the old expression, widows and orphans are, are, are being preyed upon to send money. We don't know where, uh, but we know a lot of it still goes to to India. Uh, and uh, w- the um, uh, the movement has been Maharishi has put the movement in the hands of uh, a, a group of basically, with a few exceptions, fools. Uh, um, and it, it the it, it will of its own accord it will cease to exist. And if we want to uh, um, take advantage of this. Uh, knowledge of transcending in one way or another we want we do want to bring the the knowledge of transcendence to the world then the uh, in the opinion of many of us the only way that we're going to do that is by forming a new movement the old we we it's impossible to think that those people will uh, ever cooperate with us because they're living in a fantasy world of of crowns and gowns and clowns, um, the the movement that we have to create has to be based upon radical honesty, absolute honesty, absolute appreciation of of the rea- reality of the past and the future. So we have to know everything. And and that's what we're we're doing today. We're uh, uh, we're so grateful uh, to Rob for being, and we're so grateful to Judith and and Teresa who spoke last month for helping us to put all of this in perspective. Of course, it's it's uh, um, there are many parts to the full perspective, and the the effectiveness of TM is another and the, you know the reality of the scientific research but in the light of uh, what rob has has told us and what others have told us and what we know as far as uh, money and politics and sex are concerned um it, it, we have to consider what we're going to do we have we we do have some wonderful knowledge um, but how do we create a, 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 a this? And again, you know, the whole question of uh, uh, what I'm saying is, we have to. One of the things I'm saying is, we have to reevaluate all of the things that Marashi did and said, because we don't, we, we can't know anymore that uh, his cognitions. For example, to take a very basic uh, example, his uh, translation of the and commentary on the Bhagavad Gita, which we have all taken to be sort of divine cognition, you know, is that accurate? And all of the other things he he claimed to be able to comment comment on uh, uh, the the Vedas, uh, uh, which is the junction point of absolute and relative. Uh, uh, is is that true? I'm talking about his Apaur Shaya Basha, his uh, uncreated commentary, and uh, the Sanghita and Rishi Devata and Chandas. In the light of his personal behavior, that we have to reevaluate all of those things as if, you know from as best we can. And and uh, from a uh, from the level of common sense rather than the level of uh, uh, perceiving it as the TMO would have us perceive it as Bevan Morris would have us perceive it as divine cognition. 
So what I'm saying is we have to start from the 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 the, uh, the movement has collapsed to ashes, and we have to make the phoenix rise from the ashes. And that phoenix that rises from the ashes, that new movement, whatever form it takes, has to be based on radical honesty. And people here, uh, and Rob is one, and and Aria Siegel is another, and the other, there are others who tell, will tell us that there are other ways to transcend. There's perhaps more effective ways to transcend. Well, we want to know what they are. And so that's what this hive is all about. It's about starting from ground zero and and making the phoenix rise from from the ashes. That's what we're here for. So we're here to 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 be absolutely honest, to know exactly what happened in the past and to create a future. <laughs>